I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. And in this video, I'm going to be offering a few thoughts on not being conformed to this world. And in relation to that, uh, some thoughts about this book by, uh, there we are, Greg Lukanov and Jonathan Haidt, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. There it is. It's a, it's a fascinating book. It's not a Christian book at all. The, the authors are both, as far as I can tell, or certainly they are not evangelicals. And what they're doing is they're looking at trends, tensions, uh, what they talk about as three great untruths that are setting up young people in the United States and in the Western world more generally for failure. Now, because one of the things is that whatever starts in the United States has a tendency to spread over all the world, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And in this book, they deal with three great untruths, as they call them. The untruth of fragility, what doesn't kill you, makes you weaker. The untruth of emotional reasoning, always trust your feelings. And the untruth of us versus them, life is a battle between good people and evil people. And this is what we see in the world today. We see that these ideas are incredibly influential, even though most people wouldn't articulate them as such, even though, in fact, there's nobody out there articulating them as such. Not in terms of this is a coherent structure, but these are ideas that are in, to use a German word that's found its way into English, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. And this is what Paul is cautioning about in our text in Romans 12 and verse 2 do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind because it's very easy we live in a culture we're like as one has spoken of it as fish in water the fish doesn't know it's wet because it's in the water all the time so it doesn't know what it means not to be wet and therefore it doesn't really understand that it's wet we are immersed in culture, whether we like it or not. You turn on the news and you are, you are immersed in culture, however you get your news. You go out into the world and you see the advertisements, you see the way the world is, and you are surrounded by culture, whatever that culture is. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing to people, writing to Rome, to Romans, in the capital of the Roman Empire, in the, the great eternal city as it was known. And we are here in Western culture. We are surrounded by that culture. And one of the great dangers, and this is what the Apostle Paul is warning them about, one of the great dangers is that of thinking like the culture, of rather than critically engaging our minds when we go out and we're in the culture, we're surrounded by the culture, or when we're inside and the culture comes to us through the computer, through the television, however else we consume the culture, that we're not on our guard and going, hang on a minute, this is a culture. Now, my generation, we were growing up really with the, the tail end of a, a Christian culture. The modern generation is growing up with a culture that is increasingly post-Christian. It's paganised in the sense that it is a culture that doesn't have Christian presuppositions undergirding it. Now, I remember when I was a lad that you would go out into a big city on a Sunday and there would be hardly any shops open. Now, today, of course, we've got this lockdown, but outside of extraordinary circumstances, Sunday is a big shopping day. Going home after church on a normal, normal day outside of these deeply bizarre times we live in at the moment, You've got all those cars on the road, and most of them, they're going shopping. So, culture has changed. 
how the culture views Sunday has changed. And this is why, of course, our Sunday trading laws have changed. And one of the things that we need to be aware of is that culture changes and culture is changing. For the Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome and in Corinth and in Galatia and so on, writing to these largely Gentile churches, the problem was a culture that was completely pagan, a culture whose values and ideas and behaviours were all formed not by the Bible. Paul, Paul was a Jew, Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he says. And so Paul's ideas, Paul's childhood, Paul's culture, had been formed by the Bible. It's been now indeed it had been formed also by Pharisaic traditions and those he had to, to deal with, but it had as its great undergirding principle, its undergirding structure was the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures. For his converts, their cultures were undergirded by ideas that had very little to do with the Bible, with God's word. They were pagan. And that's the kind of culture we find ourselves in. And where this book is very helpful is in analysing these three great tendencies. Now, another interesting point is that the authors are not right-wing. Both of them are left-leaning. But both of them are concerned with a culture that is influencing not just the political left, but is in influencing everybody. Because that's how cultural pressures tend to work. They tend to influence everybody. Well, that's enough of my introduction. What about the, the three false principles, the big untruths? Well, the first is this. The first is that of fragility. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Now, that, of course, flies completely in the face of the Bible. What does the Apostle Peter say in First Peter chapter 1? Reading from verse reading from verse three, in fact, to get the, the sense of the text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if needs be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what Peter says is the exact opposite of what our culture says. And we can see how this culture of fragility, this culture that what hurts me is a bad thing and I need to keep it as far away from me as possible. We see it's most extreme in what's called the prosperity heresy, which is the idea that God wants his people always to be in this present age healthy, wealthy and, and successful. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The, the Lord Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 16 says, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And we notice that point, in the world you shall have tribulation. One of the things that we have regularly mentioned in Scripture is that God's people suffer. Persecution, suffering, is part of being a Christian. The Lord Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes expects that. He teaches his people again and again, you will suffer for being Christians. And what we have is a tendency to say, well, suffering is bad in and of itself. Well, in one sense, of course, that's true. But for the Christian, we know, the Apostle Paul writes in Second Corinthians Chapter 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That is to say that there is a sense in which our present sufferings are good for us. They make things 
better in some ways. In other ways, of course, they don't, but fundamentally, suffering in the Christian life is is not a sign that there is something wrong. Now, this, is, this again is where the prosperity heresy is so lethal, is it says, if you're a Christian and you're suffering, it's because there's something wrong. It's because you're sinning in some way. That, of course, is the whole point that Job's comforters brought with the book of Job. Job's comforters say, look, Job, you're suffering horribly because you're an awful sinner. And Job knows it's not. And we, as the readers, know it's not. Job knows it because he knows himself. He knows that he hasn't committed any of the great sins that his friends think he must have committed to be suffering like this. And they're very well-meaning, of course. Another important point with Job's friends, they're well-meaning, but they're wrong. Again, we find in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, Paul says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It has been granted as a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ. We find that a wonderful hymn in or many, many scholars believe it to be a hymn in Philippians chapter 2 that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He humbled himself unto death. And through death, he conquered death. So, fragility, what doesn't kill me makes me weaker. No, says the scripture, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Suffering in the Christian life gives us perseverance. It makes us stronger people as we pass through much tribulation. We are indeed to be persevering people. We persevere. It's notable that Reformed theology speaks of the perseverance of the saints, because absolutely the perseverance of the saints is one of the great facts of... Christianity. It's one of the things indeed that demonstrates the saints. The saints persevere. So that's the first great untruth, is that whatever doesn't kill me makes me weaker. The idea of fragility. Christians are not fragile. Christians are strong through the Holy Spirit within. When We are indeed weak in ourselves, but we are strong through Christ. Our second point is similar. It is that that point of emotional reasoning. Thinking, well not thinking at all really, going with our feelings, trust your feelings. That's something of course incredibly big in our culture. How you feel is right. Now, one of the, again, to refer to this book, because this is partly a video on this book, um, one of the interesting things is that one of the authors of this book suffered from depression to the point of considering suicide and realizing this problem went in for what's called cognitive behavioral therapy now cbt is about talking to your feelings confronting your feelings because as martin luther puts it in one of his poems feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving to quote samuel rutherford the great scottish theologian who was exiled, exiled to Aberdeen for speaking out against the, the government of his day. And he says that when he was exiled, he had this great feeling of depression. He'd been torn away from all his friends, from his parish, from his congregation, and dumped in this city where he knew nobody. And he says that his first thoughts were, God doesn't love me. Why am I here? If I were truly loved by God, wouldn't God have kept me at home? And very often we have these thoughts, and it's helpful to look at other people's thoughts. This is where uh, some of the old Christian biographies that go, or pretty autobiographies, things like Bunyan's Grace Abounding and Augustine's Confessions, and Halliburton's memoirs, where these are very, very helpful because they give us an inward look. And Rutherford, again, in his letters, and he's, having said this, he says, but now I see that our apprehensions are not canonical. Our fears aren't the Bible. 
That's a great insight. Our fears aren't the Bible. We do not look, as the Apostle Paul, at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. And we find this modelled for us, to some extent, in the Psalms. In Psalm 42, we have that great refrain, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And we can say that just as Martin Luther, feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving, is talking to himself and saying, look, don't trust your feelings. My hope is in the word of God. Trust God, not your feelings. What has the Bible said? What does God say in the Bible? Not how do I feel, because very often we feel everything is horrible, everything is awful, the world is, is about to end. There is a tendency, particularly with those who suffer with anxiety, and, and if you have some very traumatic event happen, you can feel, oh, everything's lost. You, there's a tendency to, to use a, a technical term, catastrophize. Everything is going to be as bad as it can possibly be. And what God does in Scripture is he tells us, no, it will not be as bad as it can possibly be. Not for God's people. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God, says the Scripture. But we enter the kingdom of God through that tribulation because it is God's desire that that is how things shall be. So we find in Psalm 73, Psalm 73, Asaph is looking at he's looking at the prosperity of the wicked he says i was envious of the boastful when i saw the prosperity of the wicked he describes how these people have such an easy life and when they die they don't die screaming in agony they die peacefully in their beds at home and this led him to to doubt the goodness of god and he says that but when i went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. In other words, his issue was that he was looking at the outward, he was contemplating the outward, and he wasn't contemplating what God had said in his word. So emotional reasoning is anathema to Christianity. Instead, we are to be people of the book. We do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. We listen to God's holy word and let that control our feelings we also remember that god has made us not just creatures with feelings but creatures with minds he, he has given us minds to think with and the mind that the christian has is the mind of christ and we are to seek the mind of christ not to be guided by our feelings whether they're depression or anger or anything else but we are to be guided by the word of God. The third great untruth is a little bit more complicated to unpack to some extent, and it's this idea that the world is a conflict between good people and bad people. And this is something that it's quite easy for Christians to, to latch on to, because, of course, the Bible speaks of good and evil. And there are evil people. There are people who have evil schemes, evil ideas. The wicked man appears again and again in Scripture. However, the fundamental battle for the Christian is not a battle between good people and evil people. And where this very often can go into uh, huge mistakes is when it comes to, to people taking this idea of a battle between good people and bad people and making both groups formal. So the good people, of course, are us Christians, and the bad people are those pagans, those non-Christians. And those bad people are really all together. There's a, a conscious conspiracy. Well, actually, the Bible says our primary conflict is a conflict that is spiritual. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That the primary conflict for the Christian is spiritual. 
and it also means that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are spiritual weapons because we're in a spiritual struggle. And how then do we deal with those who set themselves against us? Because here it's the reality that there is conflict in the world and this spiritual conflict very often does involve also human beings. Now, they come from various angles. It's notable if you look at the Acts of the Apostles. You've got these two groups within the the unbelieving Hebrew Jewish community, the unbelieving Jewish community. You've got the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And both of them were agreed. They didn't like Jesus. Both of them were opposed to him. They joined together. And yet we find that they they might have joined together to do that, but they were opposed to one another. The Pharisees are the, the popular Bible teachers, if you will. They're the popular preachers. The nearest equivalent of British history would be the Methodists, the Methodist preachers. On the other hand, the Sadducees are the aristocratic priesthood. And the Pharisees affirm the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees denied it. And as we see in the book of Acts, one of the easiest ways to start a f an argument in the Sanhedrin was to talk about the resurrection of the dead. Because the Sadducees would go, no, oh, resurrection, no such thing. And the Pharisees go, yay, resurrection. And that demonstrates that, okay, these people may be joined together for that, but they're violently opposed to one another. So, But how are we to respond then as Christians? Because absolutely there is opposition. How do we respond to that opposition? Well, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible as much as depends on you, live peacefully, peaceably with all men. In other words, if there is opposition, we're not to be rule opposition back. Because our weapons are not carnal. They are prayer and scripture. The Apostle Paul is not overcome by being fought. No, it's sort of task is overcome by men fighting him. He's overcome by the Holy Spirit. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of, said the poet. And so we pray, and so we seek our conquest, the conquest of the cross, not by force of arms. By force of arms we nothing can, full soon will be down ridden, but for us fights the proper man, whom God himself hath bidden, to quote Martin Luther. It's Christ who wins the victory. Ultimately the conflict is a spiritual one, between spiritual good and spiritual evil. And that conflict is, can be found in the heart of every, of ev every Christian. And so, let's not think as the, as the world does, good guys versus bad guys, but let us instead think of God versus evil, and remember that the victory is his, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Well, thank you for watching. May God bless you and keep you. Amen.